The next presentation, which is the deals with the Securities Exchange Commission, is so the U.S. equivalent of uh, CSA, the Canadian Securities Administrators. So this is uh, companies that list on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, and this section is very specific to companies involved in oil and gas activities. So we're going to talk about there's two regulations in the U.S. display guidelines that are specific to oil and gas. There's regulation S-K and regulation S-X, and we'll go through a little bit on both of them. There was a major revision to the SEC guidance in 2009. It's often referred to as the final rule. Um, we'll discuss what they changed. Talk a little bit about management discussion and analysis and other reporting requirements. So basically just what they say you have to disclose if you're going to put your reserves information in the public domain. Securities Exchange Commission is an agency of the U.S. federal government. Uh, it has three mandates to protect investors, to maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital. So these are the watchdogs for publicly traded companies in the U.S. They're responsible for enforcing federal securities laws, for imposing securities rules, and regulating the securities industry. So that's, that's a high-level overview of the Exchange Commission. They are quite active in terms of staying on top of publicly traded companies and their disclosure policies. The first regulation, Regulation S-K, establishes the reporting requirements for SEC filings uh, for publicly traded companies. So this is this is the guidelines for what you need to disclose in the format it needs to be disclosed in. Talks about annual reporting, states material change, and prescribed documents filing, so very similar to NI 51101. The underlying point in blue, that's the specific part of the disclosure legislation that Regulation S-3 falls under. And it has a, a number of sample tables that, that show you exactly how you should be able to do the documentation in your public disclosure. SSX, on the other hand, this is where the, so the SEC doesn't actually reference PRMS, as I've said a few times. Uh, PRMS is not the guidelines or the guidance used for SEC disclosure. They have their own internal definitions. SSX uh, and specifically 4-10 are where you will find the SEC definitions for reserves and resources. They are very high level. Uh, you can scan through all of 4-10 and it'll probably be two or three pages of documentation. Um, so there's very little actual legislative guidance in the SEC of what is there is quite specific. So S-X is closely related to S-K. It lays out the specific format and content of financial reports. Uh, it's very specific and very complex. It's actually the 4-10 is financial accounting and reporting for oil and gas, so a lot of it is financial related. Again, the line in blue is exactly where you'll find it in the regulatory documents. It includes definitions of oil and gas reserves and activities. So as I said, this is um, all rolled into a few pages. This is reserves and resource definitions and disclosure guidelines. <clears throat> there was a major revision to the SEC guidance or the SEC regulatory framework in 2009. Uh, is called the Final Rule 2009. Again, it was in reaction to the way the oil and gas markets were evolving in North America. So it modernized and updated the oil and gas disclosure requirements. It aligned full cost accounting rules with revised disclosures. So basically, um, it made sure that the disclosures of reserves were in accordance with the accounting procedures that companies use. Harmonized foreign private issues with disclosures for deaf domestic issuers, so it allowed companies um, that were disclosing in more than one jurisdiction, it made it look easier for them to do so. It was brought into effect in 2010, and it was incorporated directly into the SEC regulations. So there's a couple documents around uh, the final rule. The final rule itself has a, a rather lengthy document that explains what they changed as well as why they changed it. And then obviously the actual regulations just reflect the actual changes. 
major changes implemented in the final rule. The biggest one, for sure, was the prescribed price. So under the old system, uh, all SEC disclosure of oil and gas reserves were done based on a single trading state prices in the U.S. So they were all based on December 31 pricing for that year, which caused some significant issues in certain years. But anytime you're basing your asset value of your reserves, which you're putting into the hands of investors on a single trade day, um, oil and gas pricing uh, can cause big issues. And a few years back, we had some relatively enormous swings in oil and gas prices, uh, especially in late December, and it caused some major issues with uh, SEC disclosure. So instead of going, instead of using a single day constant pricing based on the secondary home trading prices, they moved to the average of 12 days, the first trading day of each month. So they now use October 1, November 1, December 1, all the way from January through to December for each month, as long as you're disclosing a December 31 report. Reduce the short term volatility so it's no longer based on what happened uh, on New Year's Eve. Maintain comparability of disclosures so it's still constant price. Everyone is still subject to using the exact same pricing scenario. The first of the month was deemed to better reflect oil and gas transactions just because of the way the, the uh, markets and the transactions work in North America. It's still not intended as an estimate of fair market value, so we've talked a little bit about COEN I 51101 trying to be a representation of net present value of the assets, whereas SED has no interest. Uh, reflecting fair market value is only interested in giving a platform for comparison. So again, uh, going back to comparative analysis, it's intended as an indication of relative reserve quantity. So it, it's only they're only concerned about uh, reserves and resources in well, reserves only. I should say there's no resources in U.S. disclosure. Uh, so they're only concerned with comparing the reserves of companies side by side relative quantities. In, prior to Final Rule 2009, uh, you were only allowed to disclose proof reserves. It was the only thing you were allowed to put on uh, public disclosure in the U.S. So no resources, no contingent, no perspective, no probable or possible. You could only disclose, disclose proof. They've moved to required disclosure of proof reserves with optional disclosure of probable and possible. They also made some changes to a few of their definitions. Uh, they permitted the, the use of new reliable technologies to establish reasonable certainty. So they're allowing companies, uh, previously companies were not allowed to book reserves to enhance recovery projects in approved category uh, unless they had demonstrated successful pilot uh, in the subject reservoir. So they changed that. They eliminated the control of designated spacing units, so it was very strict what you could book for undeveloped reserves in the U.S. Uh, you could go a very short distance from existing production. And with the advent of some of the resource plays, they realized the definitions were too strict. So they relaxed it and, and moved to larger designated spacing units. So they, they gave evaluators a little more leniency to book reserves further from existing production in certain plays if it was reasonable to do so. They revised their definitions of reserves to better align with PRMS. So there was always uh, the approved reserve definition for SEC prior to final rule was a lower level of certainty than PRMS. When they brought the final rule in in 2009, they essentially adopted the PRMS reverse definitions. They're still slightly different, but they're much more closely aligned. Uh, they implemented a timeline for undeveloped reserves. So five years is the limit under SEC. Uh, and they still do not permit the disclosure of resources. So you're not allowed to put resource volumes in the public domain. Final change implemented in the final rule 2009. Uh, originally, the SEC didn't recognize bitumen shale and coal gas as oil and gas um, activities. They were outside the scope of oil and gas activities. So they used to be mining activities, and now they've shifted to oil and gas producing. So the, the focus is now on the final product and not necessarily the extraction method. 
Um, so the shift was really made to align with how companies internally forecast their reserves. So one of the other changes uh, was to technologies and what can be booked as reserves. Um, so they changed it from techniques proved effective by production projects in the area and in the same reservoir. So basically you had to have demonstrated success in the subject reservoir uh, to techniques that have been proved effective by actual production of projects in the same reservoir, so the same standard, or alternatively you can use an analog. So they've basically gone from saying you're not allowed to book an EOR process in your reservoir unless you've demonstrated commercial viability in your reservoir to as long as you can prove that you have a good analog uh, with successful production from that technology, you can apply it to the crude reserves of your reservoir. They added some more rigor to the definition of an analog. Uh, they basically aligned it with PRMS. An analog, you can only book Another reservoir and analog, if in aggregate the properties of your reservoir are as good or better than the analog you're trying to apply. So you can't you can't say that two reservoirs are analogous if your subject reservoir is a poorer reservoir than the one you are um, trying to apply from. Must be in the same geological formation, so time equivalent deposits not be in pressure communication with the reservoir of interest. So that's just saying it can be a separate accumulation, it can be a different reservoir, um, but the properties have to be as good or better in your reservoir than the animal. Qualification of reserve audit, this is this is saying what you have to what you have to disclose to confirm that you comply with SEC regulations. So you have to provide a discussion of the internal controls, so your internal processes for evaluating your auditing. You must disclose the qualification of the technical person primarily responsible, so whoever's doing the evaluation, uh, their certification needs to be included. You must disclose whether the technical person is an employer or an outside third party. So all of these are the same as NI-51-101 and COGI. Um, but the difference is a third party auditor is not required. The SEC does not require independent evaluations. If they do choose to use a third party auditor, the entire report of the auditor, the third party auditor, needs to be disclosed with their information. And they provided a definition for the term reserves audit because there's very little guidance in the SEC about what that meant. So even though it's not mandated in the U.S. to use independent um, qualified evaluators, I would say the majority of companies, um, the vast majority of companies by number and the majority of companies do use um, third parties. And that's normally part of their internal control policies. They're usually doing that to ensure that they have a solid reserves process in place. The exception being the large super majors who have, as we discussed before, the, the same companies that are eligible for exemptions under NI 51111 generally do not use third party evaluators. Prior to the final rule in 2009, you weren't actually allowed to disclose undeveloped volumes. Um, so in 2009, they established the reporting requirements for undeveloped. So you're now required to report the total approved undeveloped volume. Uh, material changes year over year to approve undeveloped volumes. You have to disclose how much uh, undeveloped volume is convert, converted to developed producing, approved developed every year. Investments in progress, so you have, to, you have to talk about how much capital you have spent to develop those undeveloped, to convert and develop those undeveloped volumes. And you have to explain, if you go beyond the five-year limit that's recommended by the SEC, again, you have to disclose the reason that you booked approved out development reserves beyond five years. Management discussion. Um, so this is a section that's required uh, within their disclosure, where they talk about material revisions or information of material nature to the company. They have to talk about changes maybe to price, technical revisions, and change in ownership. So any, any major changes in reserves year over year have to be disclosed and they have to provide some sort of explanation or reasoning for it. Uh, they have to describe the technologies used to establish an appropriate level of certainty. So they have to, dis they have to discuss um, 
basically the basis for the evaluation of the volumes. They have to disclose what prices and costs they've used, which is pretty simple in the U.S. and the SEC mandates it. Um, and they have to discuss the performance of producing wells, including water production and hazard recovery techniques. They have to have separate discussion on mining type activities for production of hydrocarbons, so that it is if you have a mining operation as opposed to an in situ or a thermal operation, it's they have to talk about the ability to convert undeveloped to developed producing. So one of the concepts that comes up a lot in North America is companies that keep what are called stale undeveloped entities on the books. So if, if a company books undeveloped reserves for future locations, they should have a different plan in place for how to develop those reserves, and it should be on a reasonable timeline. So as soon as companies start to fail to convert undeveloped volumes uh, in the time frame that they said they would develop them in, they have to explain why they're keeping those volumes on the books or remove them from their reserves. Again, if they disclose probable and possible volumes, they have to talk about how the probable and possible volumes will evolve over time. Remaining terms of leases and concessions, so when you have international assets subject to production sharing contracts or something like that, you have to talk about the terms of those contracts. Potential effects of different forms of rights to resources, such as PSCs, on operations, so you have to, again, in complex contractual agreements that can have material impacts on your ability to produce and, and market your reserves. Investors are to be aware of uh, any major changes or any material information related to those contracts and geopolitical risk. Last section just talks a little bit about other reporting requirements. Um, you do have to disclose if you're required, if you're operating in a jurisdiction that uh, that requires you to disclose volumes to them. Like if, uh, if a large international company was producing in Mongolia and, and you guys had your disclosure regulations in place, they would have to, uh, in their SEC disclosure, they would have to say which volumes were reported to which agency. Uh, they have to report production for the last three fiscal years by geographic area, and there's actually a lot of information that needs to be reported on a three-year running scale. So when you see SEC disclosure examples, you'll see a lot of different tables that have the prior three years, uh, and they outline sales prices, production, uh, NGLs, company interest production, and marketable production. <coughs> They also have to talk uh, on a high level the number of producing wells they have and the total acreage that they have an interest in. Uh, it has to be disclosed on a total gross basis. Uh, undeveloped acreage, even where they don't have reserves on lands, they have to disclose the information about how much gross and net acres of undeveloped acreage. And again, drilling activity for the last three fiscal years by geographic area. They do have to include a description by geographic area if they're if they're operating in multiple jurisdictions. Um, so they have to break it down and talk about the number of wells, water floods, pressure maintenance, other operations, material importance. So they have to essentially put um, a paragraph or a description in for each of their geographical areas that they're operating in and their delivery commitments. So they have to talk about their ability to fulfill contracts and uh, the magnitude and number of contracts they have in place.